TV through the miracle of streaming media. I am Deborah Crone, Associate Professor at the Bard Graduate Center and co-convener with my colleague Andrew Marl of this seminar in Renaissance and Early Modern Material Culture and Decorative Arts. It's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Salvatore Settis has spent much of his long career moving between the rarefied study of Greek and Roman antiquity and its manifestations in the Renaissance and the passionate defense of cultural property and heritage in an increasingly presentist Italy. After studying classical archaeology at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, where he later became professor and then director from 1999 to 2010, He's continued to explore ancient and Renaissance art history. From 1994 to 1999, he was director at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles and has delivered prestigious lectures at the Ashmolean, the National Gallery in Washington, the Prado, and many others. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Academia Nazionale dei Lincei, the French Institute, the American Philosophical Society, the Instituto Veneto di Scienze Lettere e Arti, and the Academies of Sciences in Berlin, Munich, Brussels, and Turin. He currently chairs the Scientific Council of the Musée du Louvre. There's more. <laughs> His long and impressive list of publications includes The Future of the Classical from 2006, published by Anaudi, a monumental reference work called The Classical Tradition, written together with Anthony Grafton and Glenn Most from 2010, published by Harvard, and a book about artists and patrons in 15th and 16th centuries, also published by Arnaudi, an outspoken and influential critic of the cultural policies of the Berlusconi government. He published several books and many articles in newspapers such as La Repubblica, Il Sole 24 Ore, and the New York Times that engage with polemics concerning the preservation of historic landscapes and heritage all over the world. The vividly titled book, Popular Action, Citizens for the Common Good, that's my translation, by the way, I know that's it, but that's, was published by Inaudi in 2012, one of many of Salvatore's that deal with similar topics. He served as chair of Italy's High Council for Cultural Heritage and Landscape, and has been awarded honorary degrees in law from the University of Padua, Universities of Padua and of Rome, and uh, one in architecture by the University of Reggio Calabria. His most recent book, If Venice Dies, was just published in translation by New Vessel Press and has already received a great deal of attention due to its important admonitions about the effects of mass tourism on the fragile ecosystem of the Venetian Lagoon. Though focused on Venice, the book is a wide-ranging meditation on the delicate balance between commerce and art in Venice and in the larger world beyond Italy's shores, from which he takes many examples. Tonight's talk, as you can see, is entitled The Protection of Cultural Heritage in Italy, a short history and some current issues. Please join me in welcoming Salvatore Thank you so much, Deborah, for this generous introduction. I'm very glad to be here and to be able to say a few, uh, a few words about a very complex a very complex topic. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, very grateful to Deborah Crown and uh, to Andrew Morrell and also Laura Minsky for having arranged this visit. My topic today, as you can imagine, is a rather controversial subject. Given the dramatic difference between different countries in the cultural conservation, particularly in uh, the legal principles presiding to it, and in histories about um, or stories about how these sort of laws are uh, enforced, a difference that, uh, by the way, exists even within Europe. Italian laws, this gentleman on the screen, are three uh, different ministers that represent three different phases or stages in the Italian laws about conservation. Italian laws for protection of cultural heritage, and especially antiquities, are, as you all know, particularly strict, such as in other source countries, uh, uh, Greece, Cyprus, Turkey, and so forth, as opposed to consumer countries as the United States. This <coughs> relates to classical antiquities particularly. So at the first and more superficial level, we might say that, uh, the, that uh, unified Italy had uh, a sequence of laws, the uh, Legge Rava 1909, 
legge Bottai 1939 and Codice Urbani 2004 that also includes landscape. And I will not uh, be able to, mm, to dwell on the details of, the, of, of those laws. But before moving on, let me mention briefly two preliminary points. First, one of the peculiarities of the Italian system is that landscape and its protection are considered in Italian legal tradition, in Italian legal tradition and practice very much part of the same picture. The earliest example, dated um, uh, 1745, is what was called in technical terms Ordine del Real Patrimonio di Sicilia, a law basically <coughs> enforcing simultaneously the perpetual protection of the antiquities in Taormina and of a landscape portion, the forest of Carpinetto, that today is the national park of Etna with this famous chestnut tree, which is more than 2,000 years old. This, was a for, this law was, uh, was made by the Viceroy of Sicily, a Florentine prince, Bartolomeo Corsini, the nephew of Pope Clemens XII. While the first real law of, of landscape in unified Italy, 1920, was made by a very special minister, Benedetto Croce, the minister of, uh, of uh, education. And in, uh, in his wonderful um, text and speech at, at the Senate, he, he, he also mentioned uh, the formula by Ruskin that uh, the landscape is no less, I'm quoting, than a material and a visible representation of the nation. A second preliminary point I also want to mention is, is that, it, 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 as we um, uh, uh, shall see, the protection of cultural heritage and landscape in Italy were deemed so critically important that one of the fundamental principles of the Italian constitution, uh, signed in 1947, uh, is devoted to uh, this very principle, landscape, protection of landscape and of cultural heritage. Now, one point is that laws for protection of cultural heritage in that day severely limit free market and exploitation of archaeological artifacts and more generally art objects are quite often interpreted in the US as, as well as elsewhere as a direct expression of nationalism as opposed to universal rather than uh, universal or universalistic or global nature of art. Let me mention in this context that a curator of a most very important a creator of antiquities in a very important museum of this city, famously said in an interview in the New Yorker in 2007, quote, the Metropolitan Museum is six months older than Italy. <laughs> Italy unified in 1870, six months after we were founded. That puts things in perspective. And eh? uh, things, though, are slightly more complex. I will try to show now that laws for protection of antiquity started in Italy long before the very concept of nation was born. Though it was the birthplace of the largest political formation of ancient Mediterranean, i.e. the Roman Empire, after its fall, Italy has experienced for many centuries a continuously changing fragmentation. Here are only two of the many, uh, of the many possible maps of that fragmentation. This doesn't mean, of course, that Italy didn't exist before. When Dante says, I serve Italia, di dolore ostello, nave senza nocchiero in gran tempesta, it's a fortune so on. Ah, Italy, though slave, though in of war, ship without pile to the mighty storm, not queen of provinces, but house of shame. He has, of course, in mind something that is called Italy, though it, it was not a political unity. For, for Dante, Italy was not a unified or, or, or country or a country to be unified, but a country unified by its culture, starting from language, which Dante largely contributed to creating. But he, at the same time, took for granted that, uh, uh, that um, his Italy, in his Italy, Florence and Siena, Venice and Genoa should be different cities, different states. But there was something Italian between them. And I, I, I might uh, um, indicate other uh, examples of this, including the wonderful allegory of Italy by Valentino Boulogne, which is an extremely beautiful show at the Metropolitan Museum now. As a matter of fact, the very concept of nation in our contemporary sense was born only in late 18th and 19th century. By contrast, let me mention that in Renaissance and Baroque Rome, there were a number of national churches, which were not just San Luigi dei Francesi, but San 
Sant'Ambrogio dei Lombardi, San Giovanni dei Fiorentini, Santi Giovanni e Petronio dei Bolognesi. The Bologna was part of the pontifical states, but it was a separate nation. So nation didn't mean a, nation, a nation in our contemporary sense. On the other hand, the very first laws and norms for protection of antiquities, some of which are now on the screen, but they are not all of them, they were that, that uh, Metropolitan Museum, but we must order than the very idea of a nation in modern sense. Their norms were comparatively short and simple, very short sometimes, especially the first ones, if we read them in comparison with laws of contemporary Italy, which are exceedingly complicated. But their aim was quite clear, i.e. to avoid as much as possible the destruction and exportation of cultural property, and especially of antiquities. An especially important case is a young pop, we, 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 we should uh, slightly more than 35, uh, uh, who charged the antiquities of the letter. letter to the Pope written by Sar Castiglione, the author of 19 and to serve the would have been just can give us an idea of the main reasons why protection of what we call cultural heritage was even so important. And uh, uh, let me ju just read a few passages from it. Uh, one of the of several editions is in the large work uh, by uh, John Sherman about, about Raphael and sources about Raphael. So I'm, I'm only reading a few passages. Most Holy Father, there are many who, on bringing their feeble judgment to bear on what is written concerning the great achievement of the Romans, including the city of Rome and the wondrous skills called opulence, ornamentation, grandeur of their buildings, have come to the conclusion that this achievement is more likely to be fables than fact. Have Albert I. Raphael always <laughs> seen and still <laughs> seen among the unreasonable possible, seeming to them exceedingly simple. By this antiquities is is is, is, is always Raphael speaking. Uh, I think that I have managed to acquire a certain understanding of, of ancient architecture that gives me uh, enormous pleasure from the intellectual ap 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 appreciation of so excellent a matter and enormous grief at the sight of what you could almost call the corpse of this great, noble city, once queen of the world, so clearly, so, so clearly butchered. Those celebrated works, uh, he goes on, that were by the evil rot and ruthless violence men did in fact spend a great deal of time and energy trying to destroy those relics, including a lot of pontiffs. How many pontiffs, Holy Father, men who had the same office as your holiness? Uh, contributed to this destruction and so forth and so on. And then he says, Therefore, Holy Father, let it not be the lowest of your holiness priorities to ensure that out of respect to those divine spirits, the remembrance of whom encourages and incites to reach to the intellects among us today, what little remains of this ancient mother of the glory and renown of Italy, i.e. Rome, is not to be completely destroyed and ruined by the wicked and the ignorant, by preserving the example of the ancients to equal and better them, and so forth, and so on. That's a... a, 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 a to, 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 to arguing with the... It's the famous saying, I record that your holiness commanded me to make a drawing of ancient Rome. So these are the famous enterprise that never ended. So why 
so much attention to artworks and especially antiquities in Leo X Rome. We cannot understand this point without a much wider background, which I can only allude to, i.e. the dramatic change from the silence and oblivion of the ruins of Rome, as ideally represented in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this famous painting dated 1530. Active interest in generated the alone for many centuries. Status, particularly from, from early 15th century on, gradually moving from ruins to homes of Roman citizens, not necessarily cardinals, but also uh, of, of notaries, of, of uh, uh, bourgeoisie, we would say, and eventually to the exalted collections of the Pope himself. <coughs> Such a transition was far from obvious, and its relevance for our contemporary culture, including in more recent creations, such as the museum, can hardly be exaggerated. As we can see, for instance, in a painting by Martino di Bartolomeo, by Martino di Bartolomeo, the life of many saints is the miraculous collapse of pagan art. Saint, while one, hand, one uh, hundred years later, one century later, we see uh, one uh, in, this, in, this, in, this, in, the, in this in this wonderful portrait of Andrea Aldoni by Lotto at the other end of the spectrum the, that uh, the fragments of ancient statues may be accepted as collectible items. In the first painting, um, the miraculous collapse of pagan idols symbolizes But the process of the transition from ruins to collection and later to museum much dramatic, rather <coughs> as it was at its beginning less by the reasons of aesthetic admirations, we, we might think, than by the urgency of a political agenda. The artistic value of ancient sculpture became an important factor of development only after connotations of prestige were added to it through its purposeful reuse in a number of contexts whose significance was usually determined by power rather than by taste. <coughs> this is why collecting antiquities, especially the glorious ruins of Rome, became fashionable all throughout Europe, and a great deal of sculpture exported from Italy, but the specialized market of antiquities took shape and became increasingly important. It is as a reaction <coughs> to this explosion of a market of antiquities that papal norms of protection of cultural heritage were enforced. After Leo X and Raphael, his commissario all'antichità, Another great pop of the Renaissance, Paul III, Farnese, created in 1534 a special office, that of the Commissario, later Prefetto alle Antichità. And among them, and, and, and among the Prefetti, there were uh, the likes of uh, Giovan Pietro Bellori and Winkelmann. They were the equivalent, or we might say the model, or perhaps the president, for a number of similar offices up to the superintendents. Uh, still active in Italy and on the verge of being destroyed. Laws for protection of Rome, where they were mostly Curia, with this sort of thing, some edicts and some of those uh, Camerlenghi who uh, uh, did uh, some of those edicts, and I attract your attention to Cardinal to the last one, Cardinal Pacca, because he did very important, most elaborate laws in 1819. Nevertheless, there were constant exceptions, uh, as always in uh, in Italy, as those <laughs> interdicted by slide on the street and uh, uh, on.
up, you see the four four uh, four pouring satis that uh, uh, were in the Kiji in the in the, in the Kiji uh, collections, but were sold to King Rogs the second of Poland, <coughs> and uh, and then uh, the the the, the the sculptures, a significant portion of the Borghese collection, sold to Napoleon in 1807 by Prince Camillo Borghese, the husband of his daughter, of Napoleon's uh, uh, daughter Paolina Bonaparte, and now <coughs> a group. By the way, in looking at the, the, those four sites, uh, we may see the disadvantages of the free market, because they were all together uh, in uh, uh, originally there are four identical, not really identical, four copies after the same statue made for the uh, villa of Emperor Domitian in Castel Gandolfo. So they were all together for Domitian. They were all together in the in the in the uh, Kiji in the Kiji uh, collection. They were all together in the collection of the King of Poland and of Saxony. And then archaeologists come in and they start <coughs> saying that since they are four almost identical, they are too many. So they exchange one of them. They exchange one of them with the British Museum for plaster casts of the Parthenon sculpture. Believe it or not. And then, in uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the Royal House of Saxony asked for uh, for some uh, reparatory money from uh, from the unified Germany, and, uh, and and they decided among the works of art that they could give to the Royal House of Saxony, there was another of these four copies, and so the Royal House of, of Saxony got it back, and the day after, sold it to the Getty. <laughs> so so they, they are now in three different, in three different museums, and uh, I, uh, I was able to bring them uh, all four pieces together in, the, in, uh, in my exhibition series, the classic in the Prada Foundation in Milan. Last year, but this shows that uh, uh, this shows several things, including the disadvantages of uh, not understanding what a copy could be. <coughs> As we can see from these examples, very quickly, um, uh, evoked now, actually, norms forbidding the exportation of antiquities and other cultural property were never absolutely rigid. Instead, they were meant rather we would say in contemporary terms, rather as a mechanism for regulating the market, for limiting the market, not for closing the market totally, but for limiting the market, for regulating the market, for making it possible for the uh, officials, but particularly the papal officials in Rome and later in other states, such as the Kingdom of Naples, to uh, implement those norms with discretionality, and indeed an enormous amount of materials were sold, and those are those that you can see in, uh, in, uh, in country houses in England or in museums all over the world. Let's look for a minute at one such case. In 1728, <coughs> Cardinal Alessandro Albani, nephew of Pope Clement XI, sold to King August II of Poland, the same I, I just mentioned, 30 of its best statues that are now in Dresden. The export of antiquities was, was already of officially banned, but it should be enforced by the Cardinal Camerlengo. Now, it happens that the, 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 the Cardinal Camerlengo was another Cardinal Albani, the brother of, the, of, that, who, of, of that Cardinal Albani who wanted to sell his collection. So he said, let's do it. And they, and they did. But then, when Cardinal Alessandro Albani attempted to sell his second collection, to English collections only five years later, in 1733, the Pope was another one, Clemens XII Orsini, and he prohibited the exportation and bought the statue and founded the Capitoline Museum, which uh, is the first really public museum in Europe in 1734. And moreover, a new papal edict was issued establishing strict rules against exportation of antiquity. <coughs> Interestingly, this Pope, Corsini, was a member of the same Corsini family from Florence, and the instigator of his decision was Cardinal Neri Corsini, Cardinal Nepote. Uh, the same that in the very same years succeeded in keeping the Medici's art treasures in Florence when the last of the Medici Grand Dukes died, succeeded by Franz Stephen of Lorraine. The Patto di Famiglia, the family convention uh, between the Medici and Lorraine, ruled 
in, in, in 1737 that the Medici collections were always to remain in Florence, where they still are. Moreover, Cardinal Corsini's brother and another nephew of the Pope, Clement, uh, Clement XII, was the Prince Bartolomeo Corsini, Viceroy of Sicily, the same who enforced the law according to which uh, the, the landscape uh, around Etna and the antiquities of Taormina should be protected forever. Very similar laws and regulations were introduced in, in other Italian states, such as Venice, Lucca, Parma, Modena, Milan, and so forth and so on. And everywhere, the individual states, through local academies or erudites, were starting to catalog works of art. The first um, uh, law for a complete, ideally complete, catalog of works of art was in Venice, word we are still using. And the Italian state would also set up superintendent showing Scuola Grande di San Rocco and the Regia Custodia dell'Antichità di Sicilia royal wardenship of the antiquities of Sicily in 1778. So, five years apart in Venice and in Sicily, more or less the same thing without an agreement between them, but just because there was a common culture. Particularly important was, of course, Naples. The 18-year-old the, the 18 king, Charles of Bourbon, who entered the city to great celebration in 1734, inaugurated actually a new era in the history of the kingdom which was now once more in Pompeii, which produced an enormous quantity of new antiquities. And this situation gave the on, which was modeled after the law of the popes. Now, why such emulation between states? Now, the European Union has a lot of, uh, in, uh, of, of, uh, of legislation and a lot of agreement between different countries, but on this particular topic, it is impossible for different uh, European countries uh, within the Union to agree. While the Italian states had no agreement among themselves, but actually they did all the same thing. So, why did they do the same thing? I think that such an emulation. same page of civic and legal juridical values. The history of conservation legislation in Italy states started up in the seventh enacted extremely well thought out legislation in 1802 and 1819. That is interestingly 1802, shortly after the French depredations of works of art from Rome, and 1819, shortly after re the return of most of, the, of those works to Rome. So the double trauma of, of, of seeing a lot of out of Rome, and, and though the Pope was certainly not one of the, of the vanquishing powers, but, but, but Prussia and Russia and uh, England um, uh, and Austria agreed on, on, on giving back not just to the Pope, but also to Florence, most, not everything. Uh, a number of things are, are, are still in, in, in France, but the great majority came back. <coughs> so, let me ask this question. Why did all the Italian states of the time follow the same model and emulate each other in regulating conservation when nothing obliged them to do so? And particularly the law of the, 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 the Papal Law of 1819 by Cardinal Pacca, the one I, I, I was pointing to before, uh, were, were, uh, were, were very important because they were very elaborate and they were so well, uh, they were even imitated and imitated by the great Of uh, the, the, 
these Italian states. The roots of this spirit and tradition of the Italian cities. Great fragmentation, as I, as I mentioned, but from the 12th century on, the Italian cities developed a deeply held and highly sophisticated concept of citizenship, in which the monuments of individual cities <coughs> were basis for civic identity and for a sense of belonging which were closely linked to the very idea of a well-governed well community. Let me quote just two documents in Rome and in Siena. In Rome, two Trajan, which states, quote, in order that the public honor of the city of Rome is preserved, the column shall never be damaged or knocked down, but must remain as it is for eternity, intact and unspoiled for as long as the world shall exist. Should anyone inflict or attempt to inflict damage on it, they should be condemned to death and their assets confiscated by the treasury. So, you may, we might say that death is too much, but the problem <laughs> is still there. It's still there. And the problem of, of, of Marcus Aurelius is still there. In Constantinople, in 1162, there were two more columns, totally destroyed, because there was no law protecting them. And then my second example is the Constitute or Constitution of, the, of Siena of 1309, according to which, quote, those who govern the city must above all ensure its beauty and ornament, which is essential for the delight and amusement of foreigners, but also for the honor and prosperity of the Sienese themselves, la bellezza della città. This is what in vulgare italiano. Principles in hundreds of dollars and so forth, public benefit being the commanding principle. On the other hand, the systematization of protection of cultural heritage and the very concept of patrimony as something linked to the idea of nation is inextricably linked to, indeed, dependent from French Revolution and First Empire. While we're looking at Napoleon, looking at, uh, at the La Hoffon in the Louvre, uh, at candlelight, uh, we, um, uh, I, I want to remind you all that uh, the enormous booty taken by the French armies in Italy and elsewhere and carried off to Paris was the subject of much passionate debate. It was justified by the idea, inspired by Winkelmann, that arts only thrive where liberty reigns. It followed, therefore, that since uh, France was the uh, land of, uh, of liberty, it has the right, it has the right of, 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 of being, uh, of, of, of taking art whenever it was. Uh, there is uh, this wonderful speech by François de Neufchâteau, Minister of Interior in 1794. It was for neither kings nor popes that great artists laboured in the past, but for the French citoyen, <laughs> given that those craftsmen foresaw the destiny of people. It was for France, divine genesis, that you fashioned your masterpieces. Finally, they have found their proper destination. So this happened in... So you can imagine Fidia, uh, Fidias or Michelangelo uh, working for the French. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, reactions against this conception came not only from Italy, but especially from France itself, particularly <coughs> from Catherine de Quincy in his Lettre à Miranda sur le déplacement des monuments de l'art de l'Italie, 1796, uh, where he argued that removing works of art from their original context was a crime against historical memory. Mm -hmm. And in this context, he quotes both from the Roman law from, of classical antiquity and from the papal edicts <coughs> I mentioned before. He says also, removing works of art from their original context is a crime against historical memory. And I quote, a Raphael out of context says nothing. A, Raphael, a painting by Raphael is, is not a relic like one piece of the two cross, which by and on itself can be sufficient to communicate the virtues relating to the whole. So the idea of a contextual conservation is always more important, and this is the position that 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 uh, that finally led to the restitution of uh, works of art to Rome after the fall of Napoleon. And uh, the papal commissary for the restitution was no less than Antonio Canova. 
um, and, uh, and, and then the laws were enforced by Cardinal Bartolomeo Pacca. Here you see that uh, uh, you, you see the uh, Laocon La procession is brought into, into, into Paris in this uh, Sèvres uh, amphora, and then you see the moment when the Laocon is uh, even back, uh, the Laocon leaves the room and the artist is crying. <laughs> <laughs> so two moments, a moment when the Laocon arrives to when, when it, leaves, it leaves the pop. All these laws were explicitly inspired by the principle of the public benefit, publica utilitas, of cultural heritage, supposedly derived from classical Roman law, which therefore is a marked expression continued in Italian history and has been constantly recalled and mentioned and quoted in Italian parliaments up to now. However, once the Kingdom of Italy was established in 1860, with the addition of Rome <coughs> in 1870, it would take nearly half a century for unified law on cultural conservation to be introduced. This is, among other things, also because the leading uh, pre-unitarian uh, state who, uh, that, uh, that, um, that guided the Italian unification, the, uh, the Kingdom of, of Sardinia, had actually was the only Italian state with no law for protection of cultural antiquities. The Statuto Albertino, the constitution granted by King Charles Albert of Sardinia in 1848, granted the absolute in inviolability of private property. Precisely the opposite of what was doing when we were doing the laws of, of Rome and Naples, of Parma and Modena and so forth and so on. Such a sharp difference between contrasting traditions coming from different parts of the newly unified Italy gave rise to bitter conflicts which dragged on in the national parliaments for decades. Even as Italy's capital was moving from Turin to Florence and finally to Rome. An initial but uh, weak law was not achieved until 1902, the first law for protection of cultural patrimony of unified Italy. And meanwhile, the ancient laws of the papal <coughs> state were, were valid in, in, in Rome, the one uh, of the Grand Dukes were valid in Florence and so forth and so on. So they were, uh, Italy was a mosaic of different, of different, of different. Uh, it was very much as Europe is today in, uh, within the European Union. Uh, the Legeral of 1909 was much improved, but most of the proposed laws founded precisely on that question, the question of the primacy of public good over private interests. This was always the conflict within the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies in uh, from, 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 from late uh, um, uh, 19th century to early 20th century. In 1907 and in, in 1908, there was a significant campaign to mobilize public opinion, and this eventually led to the law of 1909, which was seen and presented explicitly as a return to the tradition of some pre unification states, primarily Rome and Naples. This law, called Legge Rava, after the name of the Minister of Education at that time, explicitly established the primacy of public interest over private property for all the buildings and movables that are of historical, archaeological, paleoethnological, or artistic interest and prohibited their sale when in public ownership. As mentioned, moreover, the Croce Law on Landscape Protection was passed in 1920, uh, slightly before the advent of fascism. And in 1939, the minister, Giuseppe Bottai, fascist minister of the fascist government, whose prime minister was Mussolini, uh, in uh, uh, 1939, Bottai set about a systematic reform and introduced two parallel laws, both in June 1939, one for protection of artistic heritage and one for protection of the countryside and landscape. These two laws of 1939 were conceived as an interrelated whole, implicitly reaffirming the principle of unity between landscape and artistic heritage that, as we have seen, was uh, experienced in Sicily at least since 1745 by the Viceroy Corsini. The Bottai laws, although passed by a fascist government, had nothing specifically fascist in them. 
They were in fact a more detailed and thorough version of the legislation produced in liberal Italy, Legge Rava and Legge Croce. This explains why the 1939 laws eventually inspired the Italian constitution, passed after the fall of the fascism in the, 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 the Article 9 of the Italian Constitution about preservation of landscape and of um, uh, artistic heritage was proposed in the Assemblea Constituente by two members of the Assemblea, Concetto Marchesi, a Sicilian professor of Latin in Padua and, and, and former uh, rector of the University of Padua, and Aldo Moro, much more well known. Uh, Italia, Italian politician uh, whose name is certainly familiar to you all. And uh, Aldo Moro was Demo Cristiano and Concetto Marchesi was Comunista, so they were uh, allied in forming this. What says Article 9 of the Constitution? The Republic shall promote the development of culture and scientific and technical research. It shall protect the landscape and the nation's historical and artistic heritage. Here, the word nation means what the word, what the word nation, nation means for us. The first of those two sentences was likely inspired by Section 8 of the US Constitution, where it says to promote the progress of science and useful arts, because the members of the Italian Constituente had um, uh, a day on on their desks uh, the, a complete Italian translation of all the constitutions in the world. So they would, they would while crafting the new constitution, they would look <coughs> at models. But the model of the second sentence, the one when uh, 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 landscape and artistic, uh, and artistic uh, patrimony or um, cultural patrimony are, are mentioned, cultural heritage, we would say are mentioned, the second section has a model, and the model is the Constitution of the Republic of Weimar, 1919, that also inspired the, rep the Constitution of Republican Spain, 1931. So I can't go into detail now, but you have here the different uh, the, 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 the texts of, of these three articles. And it is very interesting to see the, the Denkmäler der Kunst, der Geschichte und der Natur, so wie die Landschaft. Monuments of uh, art, uh, history, and nature, and the landscape. And in so forth, toda la riqueza artistica e historica del país, sea quien fuere su dueño, su celosa custodia y atenderá su perfecta conservación. El Estado protegerá también los lugares notables por su belleza natural o por su reconocido valor artístico e historia. These are two possible models which were, uh, of which the first one, the, the, the Constitution of, of Weimar, has been explicitly mentioned several times in the Assemblea Constituente in Italy. And let's pause for a moment to think why. This is again, this again has to do very much like the Leggi Paca of, 19, of 18, uh, uh, 19. This has very much to do with trauma. The Constitution of Weimar is just few months after the end of World War I, with the great defeat of Germany. The uh, Constitution of, of Republican Spain was slightly before a guerra civil that was going to happen, and the Constitution of Italy is right after World War II. As an individual life, also in the life of social and civil communities, trauma triggers a dramatic moment of meditation on past and future destinies generating mechanisms of self-defense. The pain of loss, or also prospective loss, just like death in private lives, forces us to focus on the essential factors in social life. In the Italian Constitution, Article 9 is one of the 12 founding principles of the state that form Section 1 of our Constitution. Within that context, protection of artistic heritage and Landscape is very much linked, very clearly linked to a carefully crafted framework of values, all centered upon the key concept of common good in the Constitution's wording, utilità sociale, social utility. That, uh, those principles include, for instance, relating them to the 
conservation to preservation of artistic heritage and, and, and of landscape is uh, uh, is considered as being uh, instrumental to what Article 3 of the Constitution calls the full development of human personality, and Article 2 calls the unch uh, unchallengeable duties of political, economic, and social and social solidarity, as well as to the civil liberties mentioned in several articles. And uh, um, I'm, I, I, I can't uh, I can't insist on this point too much. We don't have time for doing this. In other words, the point I wanted to make is that Article 9 of the Italian Constitution embodies a centuries-long process whose two main features are the primacy of public interest over private property and a close linkage between the protection of the cultural heritage and the protection of landscape. And now, given its long history, how does the Italian system of protection of cultural heritage work now, these very days? in a moment so different from that of the past. Basically, I would say, while in theory the system, the Italian system, including the Constitution, is perhaps the most complex in the world, in practice it works less and less. And I'd like to um, outline some key factors of it. The paradox of Italy's current cultural policy is that while it celebrates art and cultural heritage as Italy's oil, il petrolio d'Italia, or the main source of revenue, actually our politicians, so our government, with very little difference whether they are center-right or center-left, they actually dramatically reduce public investments in culture. And they are now turning the Italian tradition inside out in very recent times. Just to give you a few examples, there are fewer and fewer permanent <coughs> positions within the public offices for management and conservation of cultural heritage, which is very much felt now when there is an earthquake or a series of earthquakes like, like in, in, in Italy in the last few months, and there are not enough people to take care of, 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 of monuments, churches and palaces and so forth and so on, in historic centers. Jobs in that uh, area are being constantly cut against more than 3,000 retired employees in the last 15 years, it has recently been announced by the Minister of uh, Beni Culturali that uh, the Ministry will hire 500 new people, which is fine. But from the minute it has been announced, and the moment it will actually happen with all the intricacies of Italian bureaucracy, 570 more employees will retire. So it's, uh, it's much less than what would be needed. This explains why the reaction to earthquakes so incredibly slow and ineffective. Though many people working in the superintendents and museums and so forth, they are doing whatever they can. They are heroes individually. But the entire, uh, the entire mechanism doesn't work. If we compare what happened, let me just give you an example. When there was an earthquake in Emilia in 1996, uh, the superintendent intervened immediately, immediately, and they were uh, were able to uh, to solidify, to put in uh, in, uh, in a better situation all the bell towers, and those bell towers resisted to the earthquake of Emilia of 2012. But in 2012, the bell towers which were uh, on, uh, which were which were damaged, were not <coughs> preserved by the superintendent, but destroyed by, by dynamite, by the Italian state. <coughs> so, in uh, uh, 1996, the superintendents do exist and do save the uh, Campanile, uh, even of a small city. In, in, in 2012, it does to work this way. They are destroyed because this costs apparently less. Another uh, disturbing factor is that uh, a more general process is on the way, of not just in Italy, but also in other Mediterranean countries, probably not just in Mediterranean countries, a process of putting tourism and cultural heritage together in the same, in the same ministry, for instance. In the Italian ministry is called now Ministero dei Beni e delle Attività Culturali e del Turismo. But the implication of this is that cultural heritage is only worth 
protecting if, and to the extent that, it serves the purpose of attracting tourists. So tourism is a metaphor for economic uh, interest of, uh, of somebody. If, if, uh, if, if there is an archaeological, uh, uh, a new archaeological discovery, a new archaeological site, should it be protected or, or not? The response increasingly will be, this is happening in Greece too, yes, it, it, it must be protected if tourists will come. All the scholarly aspect of, of, of this is becoming less and less important. Another point is the concentration of resources on major, spectacular and profitable tourist attractions. Therefore, the insistence on the Coliseum in Italy. So they want, they, they want to bring more tourists to the Coliseum. There are five million people visiting the Coliseum every year. Why insist on having more people there? They should try to have more tourists in the less remote corners of Rome. While the survival of smaller museums, monuments and sites is considered at the best secondary, optional, ancillary, if not a burden to get rid of in some way. This economization of cultural, self, of cultural heritage has many aspects, and I can only mention them, just list them in a, a, a very few minutes. Devolution of services to local <coughs> comuni or regioni, ex an expanded central bureaucracy that corresponds not to an increased service but to a decreased service. The bureaucracy is increasing, increasingly important and the services rendered to the public are in increasingly less effective. Marginal total uh, marginalization of research within museums, why museums should be and superintendents should be places for research, because if you don't do research, you cannot, uh, you cannot protect a, a, a patrimony you don't know. A distinction between conservation and valorization with this bizarre notion of, juridical notion of valorization that has been introduced in Italy something like 30 years ago. The ex externalization of services to the private for profit sector and the priority the increasing priority of managerial criteria over scholarly projects. Now, this is a very disturbing picture, which is sharply contrasting with uh, the, 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 the history I've been tracing back before. And let me show a couple of examples very quickly, just uh, by way of, of conclusion. Let's see if this uh, is uh, typically uh, is a landscape all love about Italy, the UNESCO site of Val d'Orcia near Siena, a telling example of what is going on. And this, this quintessential Italian landscape near Pienza, a city founded by Pope Pius II in 1462, and still gloriously emerging from the surrounding landscape in the Val d'Orcia. Balance of countryside and cityscape is so admirably preserved that in 2004, the entire Val d'Orsa was included among the UNESCO sites. And now let's see what happens. Bad news is that immediately afterwards, do you want to buy a house in a UNESCO site? So the, the UNESCO label has been commodified, Casali di Monticello, Casa da Amare, because it is UNESCO. So you have to pay more because it is it's a UNESCO site. And this is what happens. And these are the Casali di Monticello. So this is what happens. So the UNESCO, the UNESCO label has been used in order to commodify, in order to increase, to inflate prices. So even the UNESCO label has been used for commercial reasons. You can guess from this example, which is the point of my talk today, a sharp contrast between a long history of preservation and its decline over the last few years. And uh, an even more telling example is, is, uh, um, is, uh, is Venice, where the situation is so dramatic that last July, UNESCO decided to place Venice on its World Heritage in Danger list unless substantial progress to halt the degradation of the city is made by February um, uh, 17, next year. Its ecosystem the quintessential model of interaction between nature and culture uh, is, is really threatened. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the reason why UNESCO committee expressed extreme concern about it. We will see what they will 
at, actually do, uh, uh, what they will actually do, or whether they will, as it happened in the case of Baldorcia, they will, uh, they will do nothing due to the political pressures by the Italian government. The combination of uh, ongoing transformation and proposed projects says the UNESCO decision, is threatening irreversible changes to the overall relationship between the city and the lagoon, which would erode the integrity of Venice, so far almost perfectly presented as seen in this bird's eye view of the city and its relation with contemporary photographs. Yet, a precious tourist monoculture now threatens Venice's very existence. Eight million tourists pour into the street uh, and streets and, and canals of Venice each year to the point that tourists outnumber Venetians 140 to 1. Such a devastating disproportion as the impact of a bomb is profoundly altering the population and the economy of native citizens uh, who are banished from the island city. Proposed large scale development include new deep water navigation waterways, subway running under the lagoon and so forth and so on. But the only thing I wanted to show you for a minute are the gigantic cruise liners assembling floating skyscrapers that regularly parade close to Piazza San Marco. To mention just one, the uh, ship called Divina is 220 feet high, twice as tall as the Dodge's Palace, and 1,094 feet wide, twice the breadth of the piazza. <laughs> and, so therefore, something like contemporary play is, is stealing apart Venice's social fabric, cohesion, and civic culture. <coughs> the historic center currently has uh, uh, the historic center currently has 2,400 hotels and other overnight accommodation that might grow further to satisfy the travel industry appetites and take Venice over in its entirety. The plurality of functions one per once performed by Venice historic center is now dying and being supplanted by tourism. Yet, no effective provision on Venice's behalf has been enforced so far by the Ministry of Cultural Heritage. <coughs> and no protection of environment and cultural heritage is even in the Constitution, as I mentioned. Nor are the authorities developing any project whatsoever, aimed not just at preserving the monuments of Venice, but at ensuring its citizens a future worth living. For cities are not just monuments. Cities have a body, monuments and the soul the citizens. So the prediction of, of a, logger, a, a Nobel laureate, Trotsky, uh, in his essay Watermark, written in New York, about Venice has come true. And let me quote from Trotsky. To be sure, everybody has the signs on this city. Politicians and big business especially, for nothing has a great future than money. Hence, mm. the wealth of frothy outpourings about revamping the city, increasing the oil tanker traffic in the Laguna and deepening the Laguna for the same purposes. The goal of, of all that is one, rape. That's Brodsky. We may be tempted to conclude that what is true for Val d'Orcia or Venice is equally valid for, either, for Italy in its entirety, and that a centuries old tradition in conservation cultural heritage is lost forever, as suggested by other factors and facts, such as the failure in reconstruction the precious historic center of L'Aquila after the devastating earthquake of April 9, 2009, and Aquila is still reconstructed by 5% or something, slightly more than 5%. On the other hand, though, while Italian governments are apparently unable to review their overall priorities and abiding by Italy's own constitution to place cultural heritage, education, and research before petty business, an increasing number of associations of citizens, numbering no less than 30,000 groups all over the country, is increasingly developing a new awareness of what is going on and could hopefully trigger an entirely new scenario in the years, in the years to come. That's what my, uh, I hope I, I'd like to express. After all, traumas of looting and war, destructions, and we have seen for the Editto Pacta of 1819, and for the uh, Weimar Constitution of 1919 and the Italian Constitution of 1948-49, uh, 
uh, trauma um, of loading war destruction, and we are assisting to something that is very close to the destruction of a war. Perhaps, as Orhan Pamuk has eloquently written, I quote, apparently, we cannot discover the secret of things without having our heart broken. We must humbly submit ourselves to this definitive hidden truth. We may have our, our heart broken by reflecting on continued negligence in preserving Italy's cultural heritage and on um, the sharp contrast between it, the long history of protectionist law in Italy and civic pride that governed it for many centuries. But we also know that Italy is still very rich in natural and cultural wonders. I'm showing now the small city of Gubbio in Umbria. That they are well known to and loved by an enormous number of people. That's again Gubbio. Uh, will the sheer strength of beauty help shifting priorities in Italy's political life? Not if we don't contribute through a growing awareness in public opinion based on correct and reliable information in Italy and elsewhere. A well-informed public opinion outside Italy and primarily in this country, in the US, could have an extraordinarily important role to play in the decisive influence on Italy's policies in this area. And while I thank you for your attention, I do hope you will, be, you will contribute to such a shift in awareness and in attention. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you for a, an inspiring and somewhat depressing talk. <laughs> <laughs> you have your problems, but at least everything is really great here in America. Right? <laughs> um, would you consent to answer some questions from the audience? I'm sure there are many people who have many things to, to say and to respond to this. So, Professor Sykes. Can the Italian government afford to take care of the Italian patrimony? Uh, in economic terms, that's the, uh, the normal question that is put uh, on the table. Now, uh, let me remind you that uh, um, according to official statistics, European statistics, Italy is the third country in the world after Mexico and Turkey for fiscal evasion, <laughs> which means that basically, it is proven that Italians are so clever as not to pay 154 billion a year taxes. Now, why is tax evasion protected by all governments? In it would be sufficient not to solve the problem of tax evasion in one night, but just to recover 20% of this. And you would have a lot of money for culture for schools, for hospitals and for and for whatever. It is a lie that Italy doesn't have the resources. <coughs> Italy doesn't have the resources because Italy is unofficially protecting uh, the hidden economy of unpaid taxes. And the, uh, there is no country like this in Europe. No country like this in the whole European Union. That's by the way one of the reasons that's a key uh, factor to understand what's going on in Europe. When you read the newspapers that the Italian government, and I'm not just talking about Renzi, but also <coughs> other prime ministers, that they are protesting against Europe because uh, Europe wants to strangle Italy with uh, austerity and these sort of things. But the reason why Europe is, in, is insisting so much is that they do know about this figure I've, uh, I've, been, I've been mentioning a minute ago. So how can Italy be serious about saying we don't have money to uh, 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 Some uh, initial measure to contrast tax evasion should be taken. And from this point on, I think Italy would be more reliable. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sad as an Italian citizen. I have to, uh, to, to, to tell these sort of things. But the fact is that Amicus Plato said magis amica, veritas. <laughs> Um, Dean Miller. Thank you very much for this, um, and especially for the long history of uh, 
local and regional preservationist legislation uh, and the logic behind it. And it got me to thinking about a, a question, uh, a puzzle, which is the, the way you present the logic in terms of the common good as the justification for the various laws, it's exactly parallel to uh, arguments for eminent domain, yeah. you know, forced, um, forced seizure. But I'm wondering why uh, eminent domain is much more accepted and used, but the, the spirit of conservation is much, much weaker and the enforcement has been much more erratic than eminent domain. This is, this is a, a, an extremely good point. The, eminent, the, 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 the doctrine of eminent domain is very important, particularly as a, uh, as, a, as a legacy of Roman law and as a legacy also of the Napoleonic Code and the very concept of demanio in Italy, uh, or, uh, which also comes from the, from the Napoleonic Code, applies even to cultural properties to public cultural properties. And I've, 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 I've dealt with exactly this problem in the book that, uh, uh, that Deborah quoted, Azione Popolare, because this sort of Azione Popolare is also a, 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 another concept of, uh, uh, of, of Roman law. And I think that uh, the, 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 the reason why I'm, I'm insisting so much on the continued um, relationship and on the ex extremely important link between landscape, i.e. territory on which the eminent domain is generally recognized, and patrimony is precisely because I think that a common doctrine should be clearly regarding the two. And if you read, the, the, it, it is possible, not now, to show that this is what the Italian Constitution actually says when uh, at Article 42 the, um, the private property is limited by social utility. So that's uh, uh, which, uh, which is another way of speaking about, about uh, uh, the, the eminent domain. Is it still um, the case in Italy that people who do own historic palazzi have to make those available to public viewing? In well, not necessarily. It depends whether you only have to make them available to the public uh, if you ask, if you apply for public funding. If you apply for public funding, public funding can be given to you, but in this case you have to negotiate that you will open your uh, palace to the public for a uh, one day a week or something like this. Uh, but if you if you are wealth uh, uh, wealthy enough to have a big palace and you, you have enough money to pay for it, you can you can uh, you can uh, you can live with it as you wish. Of course, there are in Italy in incredibly large private collections and uh, and museums. Doria Panfili, let me just mention, uh, which is one of the largest, I think, private museums in the world, and um, and. The Torlonia family in Rome owns uh, Villa Albani, which is an exceedingly wonderful <coughs> place where to be, which, is vis uh, which can be visited only uh, by appointment. And they also have the uh, Museo Torlonia, which is not visible in the last uh, 50 years or so, but now they just came to an agreement with the Italian state, so it will reopen. and. Uh, the, the status of the Museo Tolonia, which is only a small part of the, of the Tolonia collection, they have 694 Greek and Roman sculptures, uh, some of which of supreme quality. So that's uh, a, 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 and, and it belongs to them. They, 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 if they want. Uh, uh, they, they, they are now asking for the state to uh, give them a, mm, a, a state-owned uh, building where to put this collection on display. And in this case, they will have to, 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 to make it available. So that's the general principle. Okay. So in this contest between tourism on the one hand and patrimony on the other hand and the, and the maintenance of patrimony out of, let's just call it a historical responsibility, where do, where do most citizens stand 
literally, because it strikes me that as well one of the great problems is that uh, the shopkeepers, the hotel owners, the, the, the restaurant owners and so forth actually are on the side of tourism rather than on the side of patrimony when the two are in conflict. And they're not, they don't necessarily have to be in conflict, but that's the way they turn out to be in places like Venice, Rome, or Florence. The, this is a, 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 a very good question, but it is very difficult to offer a very good answer. <laughs> let me try, and uh, let me try by, by, by putting your question against a double backdrop. One is that there is a, 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 a general crisis of occupation in Italy. Uh, as I was mentioned no. before in the corridor, uh, unemployment of people under 40 is 38% in Italy against 22% on average in the European Union. So 38% is a lot. One point. Second point, um, according to uh, a, um, I don't remember now their name, it's an American economist who is working on creativity, who wrote a book on creativity, I don't know the name now, but I wrote an article about it in La Repubblica because uh, it was very interesting. <coughs> it's uh, about the decline of creativity in some countries, and he, he mentions Italy as an example. So there is, on the one hand, economic crisis, on the, on, on the other hand, uh, the um, decline of creativity, which is encouraged by the decreasing funding of research. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the place for creativity, how can creativity flourish? So uh, against these two things, many Italians, too many Italians, see tourism as uh, as, a, as, a as something, at least we have tourism, that's right. uh, and th and that's why in Italy the uh, a sentence from from the, uh, from Dostoevsky's the idiot, the, the beauty will save the world, is taken as a slogan, but beauty will not save nothing if we don't save beauty. That's that's, <laughs> that's very clear. Uh, we have to save beauty, and then beauty will do something for us. But we have to do something for the beauty. Now, uh, so I, I think that this is what happens in uh, in Venice. In Venice, those gigantic cruise ships, the, 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 few, the few Venetians left in the city are divided. There are those who are strongly uh, opponents, who organize uh, uh, protests and manifestations and so forth, but there are also those who are very much in power who say, what else, what, what, what kind of alternative do we have? So, and, and uh, uh, we, uh, we, re we really lack so far a public, uh, uh, a public policy or a public project for a policy, let me say, even one step before, or oriented at uh, trying to contrast this decline in creativity, trying to work on schools, on education, on research, and so forth, and, and, and so on, that would, at least to my mind, include uh, the, the whole uh, uh, sector of, uh, of museums, superintendents, and so forth, and so on. So can I follow that up and ask us another question, which is, uh, where do you see the place of education, and I'm thinking particularly of, uh, of uh, pre-college, pre-university yeah. education yeah. in this whole argument. I know that in my discussions with, uh, with, uh, for example, my French colleagues, uh, they all they all think that the Italian instruction system is for art and store and, uh, and patrimony is much stronger. But since so much of what happens in any country is determined by the kind of awareness that people that people have of their own past. Uh, where do you see the? Uh, where, where, where do you see the situation? It is true. This, uh, it was Andrea Chastel who, who constantly said, uh, "Italians are fortunate to have art history in the school and mm -hmm. liceo and so forth and so on." And there is some. There is very little actually. And if you look at the at the handbooks, perhaps it would be better. <laughs> there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Some handbooks are really are, are really bad. But uh, um, <laughs> but there is there is something there. On the other hand, uh, the entire system of education in Italy is still based on the, uh, on the Gentile law of the 1920s, which was very much uh, based on, a, 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 on, on some sort of historicism by which everything should be studied historically. 
and uh, uh, and this worked very well. That's the reason why uh, in uh, in, uh, in traditional Italian schools like the one I I, I have been doing as a child, as a boy, and so forth, uh, was uh, uh, there was a systematic uh, way of repeating. We 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 had. Uh, a complete course of history in the elementary school and then again in the, in the middle school and then again in the liceo three times so you had you could study uh, the story from an emperor three times in your life and uh, of course uh, each time more uh, uh, more uh, accurately now this is gone this this is uh, this has been fragmented and destroyed slowly no uh, uh, no minister so far had the, the, um, uh, the courage, I, 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 I would say, or to, to say we have to change totally this system. But the system is being dismantled slowly. Just uh, uh, this is exactly what, uh, what, uh, what's happening with the superintendents and so forth and so on. And one point of this is that while there was in, in the Italian school a, a discipline called Educazione Civica that consisted basically in reading and commenting the Constitution. This had been totally eliminated, totally eliminated. And the Ministry of the Ministero della Pubblica Istruzione, this was the name, uh, during the fashion it was the uh, Ministero dell'Educazione Nazionale and then again the Ministero della Pubblica Istruzione. So the word, there was the word public or the word national. Now the word public uh, is being deleted. Now it's Ministero dell'Istruzione. And they claim, many ministers of all different uh, uh, parties, uh, uh, they, they say that, uh, uh, that, that, that public school and private school are the same thing, that, uh, and the, the state is moving resources from the public school, which are in mm -hmm. increasing crisis, to, to private school, particularly schools owned by the Roman church. Mm -hmm. and while the constitution says very clearly, very clearly, the Constitution says very clearly that the, uh, uh, the instruction is, is totally free, but private school must find their funding. Uh, now, uh, the, this is no longer the case. So I think that the entire system is, is, uh, is, is being dismantled uh, slowly and, and nothing to work. And the, uh, the, the purpose of, of, of the school is increasingly less to educate citizens uh, in their awareness of being citizens. And uh, uh, the teaching of art history or of history is n n no longer oriented in that direction, but rather to educate op uh, uh, operators, somebody who, can, who knows how to do something like, you know, in, uh, in uh, modern world by Charles Chaplin. You, you, you can only do one gesture, and, and that's all. That's the new idea. That this is not just an Italian phenomenon. This is no. a, 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 this is a much larger phenomenon. But uh, um, it, uh, there are many, many teachers in Italy who are very resistant to this. Uh, but uh, but the school is in great, great crisis, and and uh, it's uh, constantly underfunded, and, and, and funds are, are diminishing year by year. So that's one aspect of this. Uh, of this uh, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I was wondering about the role of private uh, foundations or private philanthropy. I mean, because the state is reducing so much the resources, is there any kind of uh, place for developing that other? Well, in, uh, uh, let me tell you a little story. I, <laughs> Which uh, I know, I know perfectly well because I, I was one of the actors of this, of that story. When I used to be a uh, chair of the uh, High Council for Culture, the Consiglio Superiore dei Beni Culturali, and Minister was Rutelli, you know those names. Some of you know the, the, those names. I uh, I said we really have very little money, very little. Uh, we have very few donors in, in, in Italy, and, and that's because they are not encouraged by fiscal, uh, by, 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 by some fiscal advantages and <coughs> So he was convinced by this. He had the Bocconi University in Milan 
develop a study on this with a proposal. And, they, the, uh, uh, and he spoke with the then Minister of uh, Economy, Padua Sklopa, uh, very nice man, by the way. And uh, 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 so there was a proposal for a law which was modeled not on after the United States, because the system is very different, but after France, where these sort of things work very well. Mm -hmm. And then I visited Paolo Sclopa in his office of Minister of, uh, of Economy, and he said, that's a good idea, but it is impossible to do it, because we, uh, uh, the state cannot renounce to the taxes of those who pay the taxes, because there are too many, if, too many tax evasions. So that's the reason why there are so few, so few donors. And I'm a, a personal witness to, this, to the state. Now, most recently, the, uh, the current minister, Franceschini, made a law by which uh, uh, some, uh, some fiscal advantage is, is, uh, has been, and, and, and so he says that's a good thing, and, uh, which, set, which in certainly is. But I think that in the first year, the, the, the amount uh, the, don the Italian donors gave to different museums uh, is something like 20 million euros. So it's nothing. It's nothing. I'm sure that, 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 that the Metropolitan Museum alone will have much more than that. Because the fiscal advantages from, from donors, I, 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 I mean. Uh, and the, 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 uh, and I, I also think another factor that there is a, 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 a lot of confusion in Italy between uh, those who want to donate something for, uh, because they are generous, and those who want to donate something and having more in exchange, which is not donation, but is something else. And this, this confusion between <laughs> these, two, these two levels is, is, is being constantly made in Italy, while in France there is a, a law of this describing the difference between these two things very clearly. And this is a law that I personally <coughs> gave in the hands of our minister, Dario Franceschini, uh, a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. but so far. I just wanted to ask you your thoughts on, or maybe your predictions on Amatrice and the rebuilding of that town. I mean, so much of that town was based around the fact that it was this historic town and it drew a lot of, not just foreign tourists, but a lot of Italians would go to Amatrice. So when they say they're going to rebuild the town, how much do they take into consideration the fact that it was one of these historic towns with so many buildings from the 1400s? And yeah. do they even try to rebuild that or is it just lost? Well, I can't, I can't tell because uh, the, the things they are saying are fine. The point is whether they will uh, do those things or not. Because uh, after L'Aquila, everything changed. N normally, Italy is one of the most seismic uh, countries of the world. And 44% of, uh, of the Italian territory is subject to high, high seismic danger. 44%. 10% is in very bad conditions from a hydrogeological point of view. And 6.6% uh, uh, is in, uh, I, I miss the word, Frana, how, how should it say, Frana? Failure slide. Failure slide. 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 So that's, that's, uh, that's what's going on. And in, in a country like this, let me tell you a little story which I, I think is very telling. Do you know when the geological map of, of Italy has been made? 1862. And it was made by Quintino Sella, a minister of uh, economy that uh, uh, historians in the room will know about. Then uh, a new project to uh, renew and to update the geological, the geological map of, of Italy started in the uh, 1980s. And they started uh, doing, and they, and they mapped, the, the, there's an updated map for 40% of the Italian territory. But this was a <coughs> research initiative because m mapping accurately the, the, the geology of a, a, such a complex uh, country requires research. So there were university professors and so forth and, and so on. But then they started cutting funds. First Berlusconi and so forth. And very tellingly, the one government that cut completely the little remaining funds was the Governo Tecnico by Mario Monti. So if a il governo dei professori, it was called, if the, a government of professors cuts the last few cents for building a, ge a geological map of Italy, being the most seismic country of Europe, what can we hope for? 
So mm -hmm. I, I think that, uh, that <coughs> the, the entire situation is uh, characterized, among other things, by a tension between what uh, is being said after each and every, uh, in, in every earthquake and what is actually being done. And uh, to, uh, the, the hierarchy of values is very clearly expressed by what happened, I think, in 2009, when a slide in uh, um, the little town of Giampiglieri in Sicily, close to Messina, um, a slide killed 39 people. And evidence that this whole area around Messina, and uh, the same is true around Reggio Calabria, these are the places where I uh, where I'm coming from, by the way, so I know the situation very well. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, making clear how, uh, how, how dangerous it is to live there. And when a minister of the then government, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Berlusconi at that time, when the minister had been asked uh, whether they had the intention of doing something, he said, uh, no, it would be too expensive, because doing something in that area would cost at least, at least 2 billion euros. Okay. Then, two days later, another minister of the same government said that they, they, they wanted to do the bridge on the Straits of Messina. <laughs> 10 billion euros. Mm -hmm. 10 billion to build a bridge in the most seismic place of the entire Mediterranean are easy to find. 2 million to save the life of citizens are impossible to find. So that, this gives an idea of priorities. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that uh, uh, predicting what will, uh, will, will happen in Amatrice is difficult. What I can tell is that after L'Aquila, I can be sure that this historic city being destroyed by an network will ever be reconstructed. Okay, let's, we'll have time for one last question. Is there one last question? Well, I wonder if you can speak a bit more of the example of Pompeii, because you have shown it in the past, but you haven't talked about it nowadays, being one of the major tourist destinations and exploited touristically, but also with problems, preservation issues. Yes, in Pompeii there is a special situation, because Pompeii got more money than other archaeological sites in Italy um, for a complex um, uh, number of factors, Pompeii got a, an extraordinary um, financing of uh, something like, I think, uh, 120 million euros, uh, more or less 60% from the Italian government and 40% from the European Union. For about uh, a year and a half, the superintendent proved unable to, uh, to, 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 to actually make a project and spend them. So there was a great outcry about this. And uh, the previous minister, uh, called Brai, not Franceschini, but Brai, appointed a special superintendent uh, from uh, a university professor. And he is, he is doing a lot. So now, now Pompeii is, is moving ahead. But there was a, a very long period in, in which Pompeii didn't work very well. The, the, the relationship between tourists and the city uh, is very difficult to, um, to manage because this is a, 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 an area characterized by uh, the Neapolitan Camorra, which is a version of the Sicilian Mafia. <laughs> of the, and uh, and, uh, and um, given the unemployment situation, whatever uh, whenever you create new employment uh, opportunities, they immediately come in. And, uh, so it's, it's a very difficult situation, but I think that uh, comparatively to other situations, it, it, it is going much better than, than, than many other situations, and uh, it's the only place where I think something like 19 new archaeologists have been hired over the last few years, which is not the case in, in any other place in Italy. Well. Let me take this chance to thank our speaker for last time and invite you all to drown your sorrows with us uh, yeah. over a glass of wine. <laughs>